I am David Feldman, and this is The Mop-Up. Stuart Rhodes, leader of the Oath Keepers, was sentenced to 18 years in prison on Thursday after a jury earlier this year found him guilty of seditious conspiracy for the role he played on January 6. Rhodes, a Yale Law School graduate, during sentencing spoke for 20 minutes, and he refused to apologize, called himself a political prisoner. These people never admit they're wrong. People ask me, what is it going to take? They will never see the light. Judge Amit Mehta, during the sentencing, said the following words. I dare say, Mr. Rhodes, and I have never said this to anyone who I've ever sentenced before, you pose an ongoing threat and peril to our democracy and the fabric of this country. I dare say we all now hold our collective breaths when an election is approaching. Will we have another January 6 again? That remains to be seen. June is Gay Pride Month, and Target has come under attack from right-wing thugs for selling gay pride t-shirts, mug, coffee mugs, and other assorted woke items. The CEO of Target has been forced to take some of the items off the shelves at certain stores, saying he feared for the safety of his employees. The leader of CPAC, Matt Schlapp, has joined the chorus. I wonder if it's the gay men's chorus in San Francisco. On Twitter, he published a letter he had written to the CEO of Target, telling him, warning the CEO of Target to stop doing business with satanic designers who sell items, encouraging children to switch genders, selling items at Target, that celebrate LGBTQ plus issues at the expense of the religious community. That's what the head of CPAC, Matt Schlapp, Schlapp, Matt Schlapp, chose to lead with on Thursday. Well, he picked the wrong day to attack the LGBTQ community because on Thursday, the treasurer of the American Conservative Union, that's the organization Matt Schlapp runs, CPAC is part of the American Conservative Union, the treasurer of the American Conservative Union quit, saying a cancer is, quote, metastasizing throughout the organization, and it is about to kill our organization. Ben Jacobs over at New York Magazine writes that the treasurer of CPAC says that Matt Schlapp is raiding that organization's war chest to pay the legal fees associated with a civil lawsuit filed against Matt Schlapp back in January, where Schlapp was accused of sexually assaulting a male campaign aide working on Herschel Walker's Georgia Senate run. To be clear, Matt Schlapp, who wrote a letter to Target, the CEO of Target on Thursday, complaining that it's celebrating Gay Pride Month a little too much. It's satanic, he says. Well, the same guy, Matt Schlapp, is accused of sexually assaulting another man. The treasurer of Matt Schlapp's CPAG CPAC called it, quote, unconscionable, unquote, that Matt Schlapp continues to raise money for CPAC while not telling donors that the cash that you're donating will be spent on lawyers to defend Matt Schlapp in a sexual assault case. That would be uh, Matt Schlapp in all the different village people outfits. Conservative family values Christian nationalist Lauren Boebert also took to Twitter on Thursday to complain about a new President Biden initiative that she says targets conservatives. She says Biden is doing what Stalin did. Here is what Joe Biden announced that has Lauren Boebert feeling targeted. 
This strategy includes over 100 bold and unprecedented actions that government agencies are going to take to counter anti-Semitism. And that includes calls for action for Congress, state and local governments, companies, technology platforms, civil society, and faith leaders, all of them to act, act, silence his complicity. Silence his complicity. So Lauren Boebert spoke out against Joe Biden's plan to tamp down anti-Semitism in America. She says the effort to tamp down the scourge of anti-Semitism in America targets conservative Republicans. Now, to my Jewish friends who vote Republican, you are just as stupid as all the homosexuals, blacks, and women who vote Republican. Whether you like it or not, you're on their list. You're on, if you're Jewish, you're on the Republican Party's list. They may not come for you first, but they're coming for you. And because they're so good these days at deploying dog whistles, you won't even hear it. Lauren Boebert is getting a divorce from her husband, who has been arrested several times, including doing jail time for exposing his penis to a 16-year-old girl in a bowling alley. Business Insider reports on Thursday that one of Jason Boebert's sons, one of Lauren Boebert's sons, called 911 back in December, claiming Jason Boebert was beating him up. But before police could come to investigate, Boebert's teenage son called the police back and said, ah, it was just a mistake. Jason Boebert, when asked about the call, told Business Insider that he has four sons and that when they all reach a certain age, they want to, quote unquote, test the bull. That's what he said. I want to test the bull. These are garbage people. The entire Republican Party, garbage people from Matt Schlapp to Lauren Boebert, Ron DeS the, they're all garbage. These are just garbage people. Jason Boebert and his wife, Lauren Boebert, used to run a restaurant until it went belly up. It was in Rifle, Colorado. It was called Shooter's where waitresses walked around in tight-fitted clothing carrying a sidearm, because that's what Jesus would want. You know, we make fun of Texas on this show, but they are very generous towards people with disabilities. For example, their governor, Greg Abbott, is confined to a wheelchair after a tree branch snapped, landed on his back in the mid-'80s. And despite refusing to enforce the Americans with Disabilities Act while he was attorney general of Texas, he was still able to collect millions of dollars from the owner of that tree, even though he has since dedicated much of his political career towards tort reform and capping the kind of settlements he received to about $250,000. In other words, he collected millions of dollars on his settlement and then after he got his settlement, he's made it impossible for anyone else to get that kind of settlement again. And that says a lot about Texas's character. They elected him governor. They're very understanding and supportive of people with disabilities. And now it turns out Texas has a speaker. His name is Dade Phelan. He's a Republican from Beaumont, Texas, and apparently, Speaker Dade Phelan, Republican of Texas, apparently he suffered a massive stroke last week. But the people of Texas couldn't be more supportive of the man. I think this is great. You have a governor in a wheelchair, and now you have a, a, the Speaker of the Texas House had a massive stroke, and he's still showing up to work each day, and nobody questions him. Here is Texas Speaker Dade Phelan. Last Friday night, toiling away, working for the people, not letting a massive stroke stop him from doing the people's business, the people's business of Texas, like persecuting the LGBTQ community and making sure everyone has an assault weapon. Mr. Speaker, I move adoption. Mr. Campbell, send that amendment. The amendment is acceptable to the author. Is there objection to the opposite amendment? And the chair has done the members adopted. The chair recognizes Mr. Mr. Johnson of Harris. 
Mr. Johnson of Harris to speak in opposition to the bill. You want the chair recognizes the Niave Criado to speak. The chair recognizes the Niave Criado to speak in opposition to the bill. Isn't that great? I mean, you know, I'm sorry this man had a stroke, but he's an, an inspiration to all of us. The speaker of Texas has a massive stroke and just gets right up there and keeps working. Mr. Campbell, send that amendment. The amendment is acceptable to the author. Is there objection to the opposite amendment? And the chair has done the amendment. is adopted. Excuse what? Oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't a massive stroke. Texas Speaker Dade Phelan was shit-faced. My mistakes. Well, let's send that amendment. The amendment is acceptable to the author. Is there objection to the opposite amendment? That's too bad. I thought it was a massive stroke, and I was proud of the guy. Turns out he's just an alcoholic. Well, that's too bad. And Ken Paxton, the attorney general, the chief law enforcement officer of the state, he saw the speaker, the Texas speaker, trying to speak, the, the slurrer of the House of Texas, uh, that's Ken Paxton, and he's the attorney general of Texas, the chief law enforcement officer of the, the state. And, and he saw that the speaker was drunk and immediately called for him to resign. Uh, Ken Paxton said that the speaker was embarrassing the state of Texas. And given that Texas keeps reelecting Ted Cruz, you know, that state doesn't embarrass easy. But you know what? Maybe Ken Paxton shouldn't have said anything. The attorney general should have kept his mouth shut because on Thursday, a Republican-led committee in the House that's run by the shit-faced Dade Phelan, the speaker, miraculously, I just a coincidence, Ken Paxton calls for the speaker to resign. And then all of a sudden, one of the speaker's committees recommends that attorney general Ken Paxton be impeached. Now, we've all known about Ken Paxton for at least 10 years, right? Why is he all of a sudden impeachable? Because their dipsomaniac of a speaker is in charge, and he said, nobody calls me an alcoholic. Impeach the guy. Uh, I think that's what he said. What he said was this. Well, let's send that amendment. The amendment is acceptable to the author. Is there objection to the opposite amendment? I think in drunk ease, that means impeach Ken Paxton for calling me a, uh, a drunk. Uh, can you imagine wanting to impeach an attorney general just because he calls you a drunk? Well, actually, Ken Paxton, well, he was indicted back in 2015 on charges of securities fraud and failing to register with the state securities board while serving as a state legislator in Texas. He was selling investments and lying to potential investors, and he was indicted. Somehow the trial has yet to take place. There's another indictment. And in back, back in February of this year, the attorney general, who was indicted in 2015, the attorney general agreed to pay deputies working underneath him inside the attorney general's office. He agreed to pay them $3.3 million and apologize he apologized for his retaliation. He apologized because he retaliated right after these four lawyers working in the Texas State Justice Department accused him of committing several crimes. So the attorney general doesn't like being called a criminal. So he retaliated and then they sued and the attorney general settled, agreed to apologize to them and paid them $3.3 million. Well, actually, it didn't come out of his pocket. The state of Texas is giving his four deputies the $3.3 million. So to be clear here, Ken Paxton, the attorney general of Texas, had people working underneath them, and they were paid to prosecute criminals. But when these four deputies discovered that the guy they were working for might be a criminal... They spoke up 
And he retaliated for senior staffers working underneath Attorney General Ken Paxson at Texas will now split the $3.3 million. They already received an apology from Ken Paxson, the Attorney General. And as I said, $3.3 million isn't coming out of Ken Paxton's pocket, the state of Texas is paying those fines. It's great to be a white man in Texas, isn't it? Indicted in 2015, still no trial. And then on Thursday of this week, miraculously, for some reason, the Texas House filed 20 charges of impeachment against Ken Paxton, Attorney General, One of those charges is bribery. Uh, I don't understand why we've known this man was a criminal since 2015, and yet the Texas House did nothing. Maybe the Speaker, can you explain why, uh, Speaker Phelan, can you explain why the House waited so long? I understand that the amendment is acceptable to the author. Is there objection to the opposite amendment? Ah, Okay, thank you for explaining that to us. Speaker Phelan of Beaumont, Texas. What a great state Texas is. I have a lot of friends in Texas. I love visiting Texas, but the imbeciles who take steroids have taken over. On Thursday, Joe Biden and Speaker McCarthy said they are getting really close to reaching a deal on the debt ceiling. The House is taking a memorial day weekend break starting uh, on Friday, and it is not expected to pass any debt ceiling resolutions until after the June 1st deadline when America runs out of cash. You would think if we're going to default on all our loans and not be able to keep the federal government going, and Speaker McCarthy thinks this is cataclysmic, you wouldn't take your three to four day Memorial Day weekend. But no, they're they're going on vacation. The Treasury Department says it's going to issue one hundred fifty billion dollars of new debt to keep the government running a little longer. Well, that that sounds suspicious to me. We were told June 1st they run out of money and then suddenly they find one hundred fifty billion dollars. Meanwhile, details of a framework agreement between McCarthy and Biden were leaked to House Republicans with many members of the far-right Freedom Caucus becoming outraged that McCarthy was willing to cave. But certainly, Kevin McCarthy can wrangle the Freedom Caucus. It will be a breeze, just like the 15 rounds of voting it took for him to get elected speaker. You can negotiate with terrorists. They basically are terrorists, the Freedom Caucus. They aided and abetted the insurrection on January 6th. Look, we're about to default, so they say, although they just found $150 billion to keep the thing going. We're about to default. The House is in recess. And here is, I think, my favorite congresswoman from St. Louis, Cori Bush. They're gambling with Social Security checks, gambling with Medicare and Medicaid benefits, with food for children, and with people's rent money. And that's a bad deal. The The Dems are here. The Dems are here. The Dems are here. And we are saying, where are the Republicans? Sign the discharge petition. Madam Speaker, will you sign the discharge petition? Where are the Republicans? Sign the The discharge petition. The Speaker needs to do his job. Now, I yield back. The House debate was empty. There were no Republicans there. The Democrats were there, and the Democrats are calling on McCarthy to sign a discharge petition, which which means to bring a debt ceiling bill to the floor, and he'd rather go on vacation. So with Congress about to go on vacation and with the entire government supposedly about to default, although they just found $150 billion in an old suit, With all that going on and the Republicans about to leave for their Memorial Day weekend, what concerned Republicans most? Well, here is Congressman Glenn Grotman of Wisconsin. He's a Republican during Thursday's debate on the debt ceiling. 
This is what he's concerned about. A study was done a little while ago on the federal judiciary. I wish we had these studies for all other appointments by the Biden administration. And apparently his first two years, President Biden had appointed 97 federal judges. Of the 97 federal judges, I was expecting maybe 25 or 30 were white guys, because I know President Biden wasn't heavy on appointing more white guys. Five of the 97 judges were white guys. Of those, two were gay. So um, almost impossible for a white guy who's not gay, apparently, to get appointed here. White guys, not gay. Can't get can't get a break. White guys who aren't gay. We're about to default. And the Republicans are worried about white guys who aren't gay not being able to get a break which, of course, explains Ron DeSantis's campaign. That's what it's all about. White guys who aren't gay, who can't catch a break. Thursday was Florida Governor Ron DeSantis's first full day as a failed candidate for president. And during an interview on a right-wing podcast, DeSantis said if elected, he would seriously consider it consider pardoning Donald Trump, as well as the nearly 1,000 January 6 protesters who have been convicted or await trial. The party of insurrection. Reporters caught up with former President Donald Trump on Thursday. He was busy cheating at golf, and here's what he had to say about Ron DeSantis. Are you angry, Mr. President, that Ron DeSantis entered the race? No, I think he's a very disloyal person because he was dead. He was looking for jobs, and uh, I endorsed him, and he went up many points. He was 30 points down, at least, maybe more than that. He was dead. Uh, So I think he's very disloyal, but I don't care. Look, a poll just came out in Iowa. You saw the one that just came out a little couple of minutes ago. I'm leading by 30 or 40 points. Uh, I don't mind that at all. But no, I think he's very disloyal, but he's got no personality. If you don't have personality, politics is a very hard business. There's nothing I enjoy more than Republican and Republican violence because they speak the truth. Here's Ron DeSantis talking about the debt ceiling and who's to blame. We're 31 trillion in debt, and he added almost 8 trillion in debt in just four years as president. That's Ron DeSantis telling the truth about Donald Trump. Got to hand it to the Republicans. They, they really fight each other. It's like a cockfight. But come November, they, they, they sort it all out and they support one another. The Democrats are so afraid of fighting like the Republicans do. Fights like this make you stronger. They do. Well, Newt Gingrich used to be Speaker of the House. And after Ron DeSantis made it official, he went on Fox News to talk about the advantage Donald Trump brings to the election. One of Trump's great advantages is he talks at a level where third, fourth and fifth grade educations can say, oh, yeah, I get that. I understand it. And in fact, Trump has now made the Republican Party the party of working Americans in a way that probably hasn't been true for almost 100 years. That's the logic. He says that Donald Trump, uh, his strength is speaking to people who've had elementary school educations. And that's why. Republicans do so well with working people. They think that working people are stupid. And some working people are just as stupid as uh, the, the rich donors who give to the Republican Party. That is how Republicans think of working folk, as having fourth grade educations. And that's how Republicans govern, by running essentially for class president. I'm surprised Trump isn't running on a platform of more bake sales for the class trip to Epcot. Speaking of people with fourth grade educations, Don Jr. has a show called Trigger. And occasionally he and Kimberly, before the show starts, you know, his girlfriend, Kimberly Gargoyle, they they try to mix his Adderall and Valium just right. But sometimes, you know, the pressure to get the show ready, they, they don't get the mixture of Adderall and Valium right. And occasionally, the Oedipal conflicts just below the surface seep into Don Jr.'s monologue. Policy, grounds, or personality, Trump has the charisma of a mortician. 
and the energy that makes Jeb Bush look like an Olympian. The policies of a DC swamp rat, because we've seen, we've seen the flip flops, right? So he, he, you see who he's, he was trying to attack Ron DeSantis, but some Oedipal Freudian slip. And he said, Trump has the charisma of a mortician and the energy that makes Jeb Bush look like an Olympian. Uh, or to put it another way. Well, let's send that amendment. The amendment is acceptable to the author. Is there objection to the opposite amendment? <laughs> they're just a party of degenerates. And they're going to get us all killed. <laughs> it's great. They're getting us all killed. They're all closeted homosexuals, drinking, shooting, lying, cheating. Well, then Don Jr., on his show Triggered, accused Ron DeSantis of being a girly boy. I'm not making this up. I think what I noticed most about this whole failure to launch was without the visuals, because it's an audio only program, you realize just how sort of nasally and effeminate his voice is. I like, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get rid of that thought uh, now that it's been sort of isolated. You know, when you're on TV and you got visuals, you get a little distracted. Yeah, he was talking about Ron DeSantis launching his campaign on Twitter Spaces, which was just audio. And Don Jr., who's a, just a masculine male man, said that when you just hear Ron DeSantis' voice without the visuals, he sounds like a girly boy. Yes, Ron DeSantis isn't man enough for Don Trump Jr. Ron DeSantis is effeminate, uh, not like Don Jr.'s father, who went to military school and learned how to march in uniform. You know, I would like to say, I really would like to say that Ron DeSantis, unlike the Trumps, actually served our country. But I can't. Ron DeSantis wore the uniform, but so did Tom Cruise in A Few Good Men. <laughs> he wore a uniform too. Ron DeSantis play acted as a, a soldier. He was a JAG officer, which means he took time off from Yale Law School to, or maybe it was Harvard Law School, uh, but he took, uh, took time off from some big name law school to pad his resume by wearing the uniform and working as a lawyer for the military. JAG officers work as prosecutors or defense attorneys during court martials. Yes, they go to combat zones, but they don't fight. They're lawyers. They don't fight. They wear the uniform. The only action Ron DeSantis ever saw was while he was stationed at Gitmo watching prisoners get waterboarded. And he said absolutely nothing. Said nothing. That's the only action he saw. But here he is with Trey Gowdy on Fox News, presenting himself as a veteran who wore the uniform. Yes, he wore the uniform. He didn't see any action. He wore the uniform. All right. You uh, wore the uniform. If you are elected president, you may be the first one in a while uh, to have worn the uniform. How would you address the ongoing war in Eastern Europe between Russia and Ukraine on day one of a Ron DeSantis presidency? Well, first, I think what we need to do as a veteran is recognize that our, our military uh, has become politicized. Yes, our military has become politicized by phonies like Ron DeSantis who decide they want to run for elective office while they're attending law school. So they put on the uniform to politicize their resume. Uh, you talk about gender ideology. You talk about things like global warming that they're somehow concerned. And that's not the military that I served in. Yes, the military you served in turned a blind eye to torture. That's the military you served in. We need to return our military uh, to focusing on uh, commitment, 
focusing on the core values and the core mission, that would be something that I could take care of on day one. Uh, there'll be a new sheriff in town as commander in chief. And I think you'll see recruiting start to get back to where it needs to be because people don't want to join a woke military. And I think it's been really, really problematic. Here's why he doesn't want the military to be woke. Ron DeSantis, by every yardstick, is a fascist. And we have a serious problem in our military. It's been going on for more than a decade. Rapists in our military. There's a problem with white nationalists, neo-Nazis in our military. There's a problem with Christian white nationalist gangs and neo-Nazi gangs infiltrating our, our military. Too many members of our military were arrested on January 6th when Alabama Senator and racist and racist Tommy Tuberville, Alabama Senator and racist Tommy Tuberville, when he was asked about white nationalists in the military last week, he said, you call them white nationalists, I call them Americans. That's why people like Ron DeSantis and Tommy Tuberville do not want a woke military. Ron DeSantis doesn't want women, blacks, Hispanics, gays, lesbians, Jews, Arabs, Muslims in our military. He wants our military white and willing. He is a fascist. And when he becomes president, God forbid, he wants a military that will do his bidding, obey his orders, even if they run contrary to the promise of America. DeSantis is a fascist, pure and simple. And he knows one of the surest ways to make sure that an army is totalitarianistic and sadistic, the surest way to make sure that they support a fascist the surest way is by making sure members of the LGBTQ community and women are too scared to join. You want to prevent fascism? Get a woke military. These people, they're not a joke. We've talked about this on the show. Hitler was a joke. All the way through World War II, he was a joke. Jokes are dangerous. <music> Professor Mike Steinel is back. He is the author of Saving Charlie Parker, a novel by the book and by the, the multimedia version of the book, because it includes not just his narration, but his music as well. Mike Steinell's music, and it's a book of time travel and a mystery. And if it doesn't please you, it has the Feldman guarantee. Oh, my goodness. You tell me you didn't enjoy the book, I reimburse you. That's how much I believe in saving Charlie Parker. I haven't been enjoying it recently. Can you, can you reimburse <laughs> me? <laughs> I bought 40. <laughs> and I have, I have a box in there. Well... You can go see Professor Mike Steinell and the Mike Steinell Quintet there at Steve's Wine Bar on June 24th in Denton, Texas. We have a lot of listeners in Texas. Go to Denton, yeah. Texas and visit Steve's Wine Bar on June 24th and see the Mike Steinell Quintet, Quintet with special guest Sarah Toller. Who is Sarah Toller? She's filling well, in for she, Rosanna Eckert. She's a former student of, of ours here at North Texas. And she went on and she lived in New York for a long time and uh, had a great uh, singing business there. And, and she was an entrepreneur. She's got recordings. And she uh, ran an agency that booked uh, commercial gigs and did real well. But COVID hit and she had a little baby and they moved to Tucson. Uh, and so when COVID makes you pregnant. 
<laughs> I guess so. <laughs> she was pregnant when she had uh, oh. she had the baby right before COVID. Right. And so they had this small child and, and they couldn't do anything. And then, you know, like couldn't go out in New York and and uh, stuck in an apartment and uh, gigs not happening. And so um, they just moved, picked up and moved to Tol- Tucson. And uh, she really loves it out there. So she's going to sing that gig with us and then go with us to Vegas the next day and do our performance for the uh, American Federation of Musicians. That's exciting. And, yeah, in pl- Vegas. You're playing Vegas. Yeah. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to start the segment with one of your songs, and then we're going to end the segment with another one of your songs. Okay. What do you have to start with? Well, David, um, I felt bad today that I didn't have a song, and I felt... Uh, that I was kind of, you know, had one of those uh, writer's block. You? And Yeah, I did. You know, I didn't know what. So I wrote a song about, it's called, uh, I Got Nothing. I Got Nothing. <laughs> it's, uh, the, the hook is, I got nothing. I got diddly squat. I got hmm. bupkis and zippity doo. Now, excuse me while I eat my cordon blue. <laughs> oh, you didn't go, oh, Okay. <laughs> Uh, what, what was what were you going to rhyme with? Nothing, nothing. <laughs> you were you were looking for the rhyme with squat. Weren't you? Yes, I was. <laughs> so yeah, that's you where got you go. Pl- who who sang? Yeah. I got plenty of nothing. Is that Porgy and Bess? Yeah, that's Tim Porgy and Bess. That's a that's a good one. So you have but anyway. So let's somewhere look- along the line this afternoon, as I started to watch the show, I got more information. Like there's a verse that talks about some of the things you revealed in the pre-show. <laughs> oh, okay. So what is yeah. the name of the song? I got nothing. New music from Mike Steinell. I got nothing. All right, no, so nothing. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I got nothing. Nothing. I got nothing. I've been sitting right here since a quarter to four, waiting for some inspiration. Been banging on the keyboard, staring out the door. I guess my mind is on vacation. I got a slot to fill on the Feldman show. He wants his monkey to dance. If I come in light without a song to play, I'm gonna miss my big chance. But I got nothing. I got diddly squat. I got buckus and zippity doo. Now excuse me now. Need to eat some cordon blue. I've been doing these songs for a couple of years. I think I've done about 30. They're mainly composed for Feldman tears. He likes it when they're kind of dirty. But I'm coming in light, he's gonna take me to task He'll tell me all the things that for me he's done He'll make me feel small, he'll say so little I ask This is all you got when I treat you like a son I got nothing I got diddly squat I got buckus and zippity do. Excuse me now While I eat my cordon blue Singing about Trump or maybe about Rudy, but all that stuff is just a bummer. Or sing about Feldman and his hidden talent. Who knew he had the makings of a plumber? But I've hit the wall, I'm all blocked up, got nothing upstairs, no way. Doesn't really matter, it ain't no big deal. Cause Feldman showed his butt crack today. I got nothing. I got diddly squat I got buckus and zippity do. Now, if you don't mind, I'll eat my cordon blue I got nothing I got diddly squat I got silch Nada Zippity doo da, nothing in the head. All blocked up today. What can you do when you ain't no reason? 
reason to go on and write some songs. Got nothing. Wow, what a great, that is fantastic. You know, of all the songs that you've done on this show that I've never heard yet, that is the best. That is the best song that you have ever written, produced, and performed on this show that I haven't heard yet. That is an amazing thing for you to say. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I haven't heard the song yet because we're dropping it in due to technical problems, but that is... It gave me the chills. Yeah. So it's about writer's too. block. I haven't, in all honesty, we're having tech problems. So we're, we're going to, as they say, uh, put it in, drop it in post, I think is how they put it. Right. I love the last, the last verse where I say. Me too. Uh, me too. I've hit the wall. I'm all blocked up. I got the, nothing upstairs today. It don't really matter. It ain't no big deal. Because Feldman showed his butt crack today. <laughs> I showed my butt crack. <laughs> yeah, people listening to this won't realize that before the show whole started this morning or this afternoon, um, <clears throat> felt like this morning, um, David got up from the from the microphone and uh, he had some low rise pants. I'm on. wearing, I, it, I, you know, very I, trendy, David. Very trendy. I may actually, if I, I could check, I think my fly might be open. I don't think I've been outdoors all day and I've noticed I'm getting to a point and it started with COVID where my you fly. You don't zip? You don't zip up? Sometimes I've, I'm indoors so much, uh, hmm. I forget to zip up. Could that be a problem? I don't know. It hasn't been a problem for Rudy. <laughs> Not yet, at least. <laughs> Let me see. All right, I'm zipped up. Ooh. I guess he did a similar thing uh, that he did in the Borat movie. Yeah, yeah. 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 Let's, talk about, so crazy. let's talk about writer's is... block. Let me ask you about writer's block. Okay, yeah, sure. So I, basically, I turned my writer's block... But, into like, I'm just going to write about my problem of not having anything for the show. And it started to, you know, to percolate. Um, what, it's what, kind of, what kind causes, of mean to you? What, what causes writer's block? Why do people who are creative suddenly find themselves unable to produce? I suppose fear. Of what? Success? Well, fear of, uh, you know, that they're not that what they're going to write isn't very good, you know. I've been reading a lot about writing lately. I just got a, two, new, two new books. And, uh, you know, I had The Writing Well by Donald Hall and then uh, a couple others. And, and one of the things they say is just to do – this one book is called uh, – it's called uh, – what is it? Sailing the, sailing the Story or something like that. It's a really good book. It just it's about fiction, and one of the things they do in their uh, exercises is just write, write something thirty minutes, write for thirty minutes, and then you read it to the rest of the class, and uh, you know you just just write. And I think most of the really successful writers just do that every day. You know, they just there's one famous person who actually counted the words, and once he got to a thousand words, he went off. And uh, to the the cafe and had lunch, mm -hmm. you know. I should so mention Mike Steinell is a jazz trumpeter, pianist, composer, arranger, and an internationally recognized jazz educator, author of the highly acclaimed Essential Elements for Jazz Ensemble, as well as Building a Jazz Vocabulary. And you are a jazz professor. You've taught jazz for how, how many years? Forty. Actually, a little bit more than that, because I started, you know, teaching lessons even in high school to different people. Right. Um, but, you know, uh, so, hey, by the way, I got, I got another song on that Tony Kornheiser show. Did you really? Yeah, they I sent them. Uh, I sent them uh, something died in my garage. Oh, that's great. With a little a little explanation of how I say garage and how people like in the UK didn't like that, you know. 
and then I also said in the email, I sent a little introductory email with it, and they read that, and then they uh, kind of said very nice things about me, and uh, then they played at the end of the show. They played the whole song. It's a long song. It's five five minutes, and um, but uh, you know, I say I, if I was to spell garage the way I say it, it would be G R O D G E. And I said, that's just the way we talk in Kansas. I grew up in Kansas. By the way, we also say wash instead of wash. Right. And I'm I so, said, you know what? That makes me so happy that he's like a big shot, Tony Kornheiser. He's very funny. I've, I've purchased all three of his books and they're hilarious. But his show is huge. And the thing with your music is, I always think like, this is so effing brilliant. And... Well, what should I do with it, David? Well, I'm just no, but it, would ma advice. it makes me happy that he that you sent it to him, and and yes, it's it's like yes, I somebody else is you know, it's it's just great that, uh, but don't send him any more music. I have exclusive. <laughs> 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 That's my little Hollywood. Power trip with you. I think it's great that somebody else recognizes oh, yeah, your brilliance. But, yeah, great. But, but I have anymore. you exclusively. No, that really makes me because it it confirms, like, yes, somebody else sees the gene. You know. So let me ask you about writer's block. Okay. As a a jazz musician, where it's free form and you're improvising, what kind of writer's block can hit a jazz performer? Well, I think one of the things that can happen is you just get stuck in your own vocabulary. You can just kind of just be playing the things that you're practicing, you know, and maybe rearranging it a little bit. I, I but, but, to, but, but when you're in, you, you were saying last week that jazz is a conversation with both the audience and the other musicians. Yeah. Is it, and, and, is it more difficult to have writer's block? As a jazz musician, can't the other musicians snap you out of it? Throw you something, shock your system and get you moving? If they're the right, if, if they're s sympathetic to what you're doing. There are some people that I've played with where I just don't have a good idea. I just, I just don't have an idea. And there's other people that the idea is just common and I'm, I feel comfortable you know, going different places, experimenting with different things, and they go with you. And well, I, I, I try not to play with anybody but those people anymore. I just, so you say, so I, I, I want to figure this out, because I think of the, the term, you're playing with somebody else. A band plays together. You're playing. You're having fun. And I'm thinking of comedy writing, and they don't talk about it being, you know, playing with other writers, even though you're in a writing room. Uh, there are some writers who uh, I can't play with. Like, I know they're brilliant. There's just a wall between us. I can't crack their sense of humor and they can't crack mine. There isn't magic. That same thing happens with music and jazz where you just can't. Yeah, well, of course. Like you can recognize, like you can hear a musician and say, I really want to play with this person. And then you not always, you can't always hear it until you get on the stand. You can't and, always, you, you might hear somebody and say, that's fantastic. And then you get on the bandstand with them and it's hard, you know. It's it's um, is it is it if I said to you, uh, I want you to play with this drummer or pianist, but I don't want you to meet them. You can only communicate through music. So it's just clean slate. You step on the bandstand and you start talking to each other through your music. You don't know anything about this person. They have to reveal themselves to you through uh, the way they play with you, would that be helpful or counterproductive? I don't. Th I don't think it would be um, 
necessarily helpful or non helpful. If they if it's going to work, it's going to work and talk to them. I, I, I play with people that I love to play with. And sometimes we get off the bandstand. We don't have much to talk about. Right. And can I you play meet with other somebody? People. I play you? with other people that I do not like to play with, but I love to hang with. Right. You know, so it's it's always different. Can I, you I meet think, somebody? Can you get to know somebody without talking to them, but just communicating through the jazz, but just playing jazz together, get an idea of who they are as a person? Oh, yeah, for sure. What can you tell about a pianist? You, you don't you, you don't you don't know anything about them. You start playing yeah. together for three hours or two. What 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 would you be able to divine about them? Well, how generous they are, and how much ego is involved in their playing. You know, mm -hmm. you know. But um, and you know, I, I used to tell my students, you should try to. When you play, by the way, play is a really interesting word. Jazz musicians don't just play music. They play with music. You know, they you're playing with the notes. You know, you're not just playing what you played before. Hopefully you're you're, you're it's playful what you what you do in the novel. I write about that, like um, how Charlie Parker's most of his greatest work is he's he's playful with the rhythms. He's playful with the harmony. He's taking chances you know it's really interesting but what i was going to say was i used to tell my students you know it it's the most important thing is you for you to say something and not prove something i hear a lot of young players when they stand and start to play they're they're there to prove something and i used to feel explain that, way that too. to me explain that to me play <clears throat> play uh, uh with an excess amount of energy with the, or try to like uh, you know like do something um you know, extra technical, you know, that's impressive. Uh, do something impressive. So I in writing, it would be like using fancy words. Exactly. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So like what Using, I do, I have nothing to say. <laughs> so I just pat it with a thesaurus. I don't think that's true, David. I don't think that's true. So say, you have to say something. It's better to, it's more important to, to be able to say something rather than to be playing to prove something. Now, Charlie Parker. Yeah. Was he generous? If you shared a, a stage with him, was he generous? Here's the thing. Charlie Parker was such a strong personality. You had to go with him, I think. And, you know, there were recordings <clears throat> in the transitional in his early career, and sometimes once in a while in a later career where he would play with... Um, musicians who were older and from a different from the swing school and so it was kind of an odd mix he always made it work though but he was just so he was just such a um, huge personality musically that he could just plow through whatever whatever situation the greatest ones can sound great with a high school band or a middle school band you know they're not deterred nothing is nothing shakes their feeling for the time their rhythm their feeling for the harmony you know lesser players like me i've i've <laughs> i've been in situations where i step into here i'm going to demonstrate in this band in this high school band um how to play this thing you know and i take here let me try your part here and uh when the people around you are struggling and there's and the pitch is all weird it's it physically it takes much more strength to play the trumpet You'll, you're going to get tired just from adjusting to everybody around you and uh there's a famous story about a f famous uh lead player who was kind of soft-spoken he was out in western kansas working with the his name is jim maxwell and he was uh, out in Ka kansas working with a high school band and the kid was step the, the lead player was stepping all over the part you know and he goes <laughs> He goes, oh, let me let me go back there and help you with this. And said, let me try that. Scoot over, kid. And he he plays with the band and he steps all over it. And he turns to the kid after it's done and goes, wow, they gave you the hard part. <laughs> 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 the trumpet, I, I, I played the trumpet uh, 
I was horrible. We should play some duets. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. I have no umberture. I mean, it's just horrible. I, uh, you still, you still own a trumpet? Uh, probably somewhere in my mom's house. And I, Stuff. and my grandfather, I ended up with his coronet. Ooh, that might be worth something. Really? Take a picture of it and send it to me. Okay. If it's an antique, some of those are, if it's, if it's still working, you know. I think that was the first trumpet that I played. But, you know, no offense, the, the trumpet doesn't get you laid, does it? <laughs> Just like if you bring a, a David, woman. I can't answer that. If you're 18 years old and you bring a woman back to your apartment or dorm or. I, I, I don't think. Song, I don't th <laughs> you know, you blow okay, your ears. I, I played in bands on the road. The lead singer. He's the one that gets the most attention. But there's usually plenty of women. There were plenty of women, you know. And but what I'm saying is you, you, you bring a woman back to your hotel room and you say, I wrote a song for My you. wife's going to listen to this. That never happened, honey. I, I never I'm just saying any. you start bla blaring the, the trumpet in a hotel at three in the morning. Is that going to is that romantic? <laughs> I'm being serious. I, I can't. There's some movie somewhere. Or some yes, Pennies TV from show. Heaven. Uh, uh, Steve Martin and... Uh, Is a strolling trumpeter playing really loud next to their table? Is that what you're thinking of? No, uh, uh, Peter. Oh, oh, yeah, who, who, yeah. Who's the, his yeah. co-star? Uh, I can't believe it. Bernadette Peters. Bernadette Peters. They're sitting on a beach. And she's playing the trumpet. And yeah. She either plays the trumpet or the trombone in a romantic... And I remember watching that and laughing so hard and thinking <laughs> there's nothing... <laughs> romantic about brass instruments maybe a clarinet right but uh, the movie i'm thinking of there's there's a couple at a table and it's a romantic and it's quiet and the the trumpet player comes over and starts playing <laughs> with a lot of vibrato you know right in their ear so what is it, the instrument i guess the guitar because it's so phallic it's an extension is the what if in terms of just losing your virginity what is the sexiest instrument? Okay. Some people would say the cello has the shape of a woman. Yeah. It sits between your legs. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. You, yeah. You kind of yeah. you, you kind of hug it. Yeah. And you play it, you know. Yeah. Did Pablo Casals play the cello? He did. He was yeah. great. Yeah. And Yo Yo Ma. Fantastic. Yo Yo Ma. That's Both right. virgins, by the way. What but do you mean? I'm just making a joke. <laughs> uh, what about the uh, piano? I think you can... It, it, maybe the piano, right? That could be... This, is a, this should be a study for Downbeat Magazine. Which instrument <laughs> is the most um, sexually appealing to the opposite sex? Now, if you... If you if I you think that a, actually in New York City, I, I would suspect if you're in a band... The guy who gets laid the most is the tambourine player, because that suggests he's rich. The only reason he's in the band is he has zero talent, and he's rich. And I think in New York City that goes a long way. Is there yeah. a play, is playing the tambourine? Can, 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 does, does somebody teach the tambourine? Oh yeah, it's to play it. There's a whole technique. And there's a lot you can do more than just, you know, booty slap it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you hit it on your hip. Yeah. The booty slap. So, the, in other words, if I said in a script, you have your tambourine lessons in an hour, that would that be funny or would that be true? They do. There's some amazing. You just Google some things where they do, like, really intricate things with the tambourine. So it's not just... You know, it isn't just like gospel music and stuff. But right. the tambourine's a pretty strong instrument, you know. Right. Um, you, you know, uh, uh, recently, I just today, or it was, it, no, it was last night, I came into possession of a video, an hour-long video of, it's, it's, a, it's the Charlie Barnett Orchestra. It was a, 
a video, an hour long video that was made. And the reason I have it is that it featured a group, a rock group that I eventually played in in Kansas called the Fabulous Flippers, who had gotten some national prominence and they they signed with Willard Alexander. You've heard of Willard Alexander, right? No. Willard Alexander, Willard Alexander booked Basie Band. He booked all the big bands and uh, a lot of the stars. And so this guy, Charlie Barnett, who was independently wealthy, had one of the greatest bands in the 40s because he could just pay people whatever, you know. He was a good good musician, but he also had unlimited pocketbooks. So he made this movie and he featured, I think Willard Alexander wanted to feature something for the kids. So they had this rock band called the Flippers. And I played in the Flippers a decade later, but this was in the 60s. But it's really interesting watching this movie and, and it was Great players like um, uh, Randy Brecker was in it. Very young Randy Brecker, the, the Brecker brothers. I don't know if some people might know that name. And uh, Clark Terry. And uh, all it was this all-star cast in New York in the middle 60s. This is before the, some of these people were Tonight Show players before Johnny had moved out mm-hmm. to uh, L.A. So it was, and it was fantastic. And they never did anything with it. And it's sitting in a, in a warehouse and some, a fan of the rock group found it in a catalog and bought it. Now kind of is disseminating this, uh, this, it was on VHS. It's been digitized, but it was really interesting wa- watching that and seeing like what was, what they thought was cool in the, in the mid sixties. It's pretty, right. it's pretty corny, right. pretty corny, but well done. It's so well done. It's, so swinging, you know. Um, so how are things before we play your next song? Yeah. How are things in Texas? Uh, we had rain today. We've had a lot of rain. It's, it's unfortunate because the upper Midwest, Kansas and Nebraska, is dry as a bone. And uh, that's a concern because we have uh, the house up there and and uh, you know, the lake is the lake is the lowest I've ever seen it. And the you you know, last night when we or last week when we uh, videoed or we didn't video, but you saw the video of when we broadcast from that house when I was there. Yeah. Um, the pond just over the hill is bone dry. I've never seen it bone dry. I don't know where the cows are getting their water. Um, Anything revealed? About what? In the pond, any any bodies? No, nothing. Well, that'd be good. Yeah, that'd be good, wouldn't it? They're yeah. finding a right Lake Mead in near Las Vegas. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they're finding a little some uh, underworld stuff. Yeah, I've been working on the new novel, Murder at Birdland. It's coming along. How many pages been, into it are you? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I'm uh, I'm four thousand words times. Uh, I'm forty thousand words into it. This is going to be a long one, I think. This could be eighty thousand words, Great. which isn't long for a novel. It's not a novel till it's fifty thousand. What is it before that? A novelette. Ah, and I like that a novelette. Yeah, or novella. That's what it is. It's a novella. A Sorry novelette about. sounds like like a novelty. It's it sounds like a sample of dog vomit, fake dog vomit, <laughs> right? A novelty item like a novelette. It's not the full. Fake By the dog. way, I sent you I sent you an old song from the past. It, I, I saw that when I saved those, it dates them. And this was from uh, May 21. So it's t- two years ago. Two years ago. So that yeah. would be May 21, 20. Let me don't tell me. That would be 2021. Yeah. We were in the heat of COVID at the time. We were uh, getting vaccinated. Most of us. Yeah, I've been vaccinated twice. You and now you got that's interesting because I, I know you you're an anti-vaxxer, so you finally came. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. You said to me that it was part of the one world government. They were planting (laughs) chips inside of us for David. I never said that. I I remember you said don't get one. This is because horse paste. How could you do this to me? I I remember you you said (laughs) here's some horse paste. Take this instead. Drink some bleach. You, you drink some bleach. I, yeah. Uh, so what no, is the, I'm not what, a man I've <laughs> I know. Anyway, I know. so, it, but you had, 
Who's afraid of Catherine Liu? Has it been two years since she was on? Yeah, you need to get her back. She was so delightful. She was a hoot. Oh, my God. I and can't. so smart. And had th that book is that little bitty book. Um, About the professional managerial class. Yeah. That is a great song. I haven't heard it this time around because we're <laughs> dropping it in post. It is a pretty good song. I, I love that song. I do. It's it's one of the better ones in terms of production. I think right. that I did. You know, like I, I was starting. I was starting in nineteen in, in uh, twenty twenty when I was starting to get my act together in terms of the the uh, the materials that that I was using and the background vocals and all that. The, so. I remember. It, it turns out. The end is we're we're the professional manager. Like you're worried that yeah. it's us. So did, which all I said, wanted to do was stick it to the man. <laughs> Turns out the man is who I am. <laughs> would you say when that your politics moved further and further to the left uh, in the past five years? Oh yeah. Why is that? Mine too. 
Well, geez. I mean, it's just kind of like polarities when you've got something going so f- extreme to the right, like DeSantis and the Dobbs thing. And, and also, you see, I remember a discussion with my uncle, my favorite uncle, and talking about um, Trump. You know, this was like summer of 19. Was that summer of night? Yeah, it was at my dad's funeral, summer of 19. And um, no, 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 no. This is earlier than that. This is before the before the first election. This would be 16, summer of 16. Right. And we're going into that. And I remember we, we had a discussion about Bernie and I was saying I love Bernie, but um, I don't think he was could be elected. Turns out he probably could have been elected. Yeah, but know? it would have been. I, I love Bernie. I think he's the greatest politician uh, in American history. I think he beats Eugene Debs because Bernie has been serving in the Senate. And uh, I don't know enough about history to say that. So let me take that back. But I love Bernie. And I've been listening to Bernie on the Tom Hartman show every Friday for yeah. like I decades, think for I, decades. I think decades. I think he would have been destroyed by the Democrats had he won. You know, the same way Tip O'Neill and Ted Kennedy destroyed Carter because Carter wasn't liberal enough. Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. the, the Carter wing of the Democratic Party, Pelosi and Schumer would have just destroyed Bernie's presidency. He, he, yeah, you know, we, his victory, we'll he, said, know. he said... My, my presidency is predicated on a revolution, a landslide. If he and landslides don't exist anymore in this country. So in wow. order for Bernie, you know, we, we want that Roosevelt landslide of 33. We want to paste that onto Bernie. Well, if he didn't get both houses, it would have been a disaster. You're probably right. He would have right. signed executive orders and they would have been challenged in the courts. There, a revolution means we take both houses and have a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate. We're not going to get rid of the Electoral College. We're not going to get rid of the filibuster. We have to get rid of Democrats who are rich. Got to get rid of wealthy Democrats and, and forbid them from being part of the leadership that is the answer. You cannot be. I sh- think if if you're in pol- if you're in government and you're making decisions about public education, your kids should go to public education. Exactly. I think that simple thing right there would s- solve a lot of problems. But this business of, uh, you know, school vouchers and things, it's. It's, uh, it's not good. I, I, I think the simple, you know, when they say get the money out of politics, this is the refrain that the Democrats, you know, we got to overturn Citizens United. We got to get the money out of politics. And I say we got to get the money out of politicians. Open up your books. You have to do financial disclosures. Yeah. And Ro Khanna is married, has... You know, they, he blames his wife, but he's got two hundred million dollars. You hey, you you want to vote for a Democrat? Go ahead. But you don't get to run the party. You don't know what it means for rent to be due. So, no, you you know, Nancy Pelosi, just all I want to know, how much are you worth? Let me see your disclosures. Because I keep hearing the problem is we got to get the money out of politics. And I say, no, we got to get the money out of the politicians. Can you write a song like that? Get the money out of the politicians. It's, it's, it's much easier to do a butt crack song. I know. Here's my, <laughs> I actually wrote a song. I, I, I did. Hey, butt crack, butt crack, bum, 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 bum. Please share my umbrella. 
That's good, David. Yeah, I, I actually, when I realized I showed my butt crack as I was getting my water, I immediately started singing, butt crack, butt crack, butt crack, butt crack, please share my umbrella. The Hollies, great. Was it the Hollies? Yeah, the Hollies, yeah. Bus stop, bus stop. <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great song. I'll tell you what. Not as good as butt crack, butt crack. No, you're right, you're right. Or pig for love. <laughs> All right. Love. Okay. What is the name of this song? Oh, we played it already. Who's afraid of Catherine? That's Lou? right. We, yeah, we just it. played it. We played. Yes. Uh, Mike Steinell is the author of Saving Charlie Parker, a novel. Go buy it wherever fine books are sold. And if you're in Texas, June 24th in Denton, Texas, Mike Steinell and the Mike Steinell Quintet. We'll be playing Steve's Wine Bar. What time? 7. 7 p.m. Early. Ju June 24th. We do everything early here. Yeah. June 24th, Steve's Wine Bar in beautiful Denton, Texas. And special guests, Sarah Toller. Go to sarahtoller.com. T-O-L-L-E-R? T-O-L-A-R. And go to mikesteinel.com? Or Charlie or SavingCharlieParker.com. Either one will give you a bunch of stuff, give you all the dirt on Mike Steinell. Okay. I love you. Thank you. Love you too, David. Take care. 